Hi there, I'm James Dapache, and this is Coffee and a Case Note. <laughs> Team, today we're going to talk about what would have been the dissolution of a partnership, but for the operation of a partnership agreement. And we're gonna talk about the difference between fair value and market value. And before you fall asleep with boredom, don't worry, we're gonna make it all make sense together. What we're dealing with today is a partnership and a capital P partnership in the technical sense that lawyers use. This is not merely four people in business. This is a contract between four parties that uh, meets all of the requirements of being a partnership. Each of the partners is themselves a company, and the plaintiff we're dealing with today, the party that brings today's application, is a 19% partner, uh, and according to the partnership agreement, is entitled to 19% of the assets, including the goodwill of the partnership. Now, what does the partnership do? The partnership is involved in the industry of making the second best hot drink of all, tea and tea-related products. It grows some tea, it imports some tea, it sells some tea, and it sells some tea-related products as well. And over time, the relationship uh, progresses such that the plaintiff decides it is their time to resign from the partnership. <clears throat> now, the partnership's commenced in 2018, and the resignation, uh, or purported resignation, takes place in November 2021. Now, the normal effect of the resignation of a partner is that the partnership itself dissolves. But here, the partnership agreement between the partners <clears throat> dealt with the partnership continuing on in the case of a partner retiring. And so we have this position where partners retired in November 21, the partnership otherwise continues in the absence of that partner. And what we're now really arguing about is what is our plaintiff today? What is our departing partner entitled to? That's a question that has a number of moving parts. One of the moving parts is what precisely of a legal nature is the plaintiff entitled to? The plaintiff says, look, pursuant to section 43 of the relevant Partnership Act, I'm entitled to an account. I'm entitled to my share of the partnership as at the date I retired. And what the existing partners say is, mm, we're not so sure that's the correct entitlement. Let's proceed with this valuation process that I'll come to in a moment. And that might be the subject of a sire's order, S-Y-E-R-S, a sire's order that might order that the plaintiff must sell its partnership interest to us at the value determined by the court valuer. So there's an argument between the plaintiff and the remaining partners, the defendants, on the basis of what the plaintiff, the departing partner's entitlement is. And the short point is the court comes down on the side of the plaintiff. The court says, look, um, pursuant to the legislation, there is an entitlement for the departing partner to enjoy an account on their departure. And the partners could have changed that in their agreement. And what they elected to do was not change that. And so the position holds. And so the plaintiff's argument that they're entitled to an account holds. And so we now switch from what sort of uh, entitlement does the plaintiff have to what is the value of that entitlement. And that is where one of the hot button issues between the defendants and the plaintiffs arises. What the plaintiff says is, broadly speaking, that I am entitled to market value, but no discounts. What the defendants say is, yeah, market value looks right, but don't forget to add the discounts. So let's dive into this issue a little bit deeper. The court, through the process of the litigation at an interlocutory stage, has an application from both the plaintiff and the defendants by consent to appoint what is sometimes called a referee, where a question the court has uh, is referred off by the court to an expert, uh, often with the agreement of all parties, and that was the case here. So it's referred off to an expert valuer. And the expert valuer comes back and corresponds with the parties and says, hey, yeah, look, I'm interested in valuing the plaintiff's interest as at the date it left the partnership, but what is the basis for that value? Do we want fair value? Do we want market value? Do we want equitable value? What are we up to? Following this question, there's an informal conference between the plaintiffs and the defendants where there's a bit of a chat that goes on. And what sort of flows from that chat and seems fairly uncontroversial is the parties agree on market value. Some further exchanges um, continue between the referee 
where the referee initially says, wait, market value, don't forget when you're talking about market value, there's gonna be a discount for the fact that this minority partner lacks control. There's gonna be a discount for the fact that this minority partner's share lacks marketability. It's gonna be difficult to find a market for these shares. And so we're gonna apply these discounts because it is a market valuation and not a fair valuation or some other form of valuation. What the plaintiff says in indirect reply to the referee making this comment is, hey look, um, we don't agree. We take the view that the correct method to use is going to be just value the thing absent these discounts. And if you consider that you must value them with these discounts, then provide two separate valuations and we can make our submissions about the appropriateness of each method before the judge. What the valuer eventually does is that. And the form of the valuation is, um, I'll usually use the word celebrated. Um, that's not the word used in the judgment, but broadly speaking, um, what the court finds is that the valuer's work was of high quality and considerable assistance to the court and indeed considerable assistance to the parties. And what the court is then confronted with is this argument of the plaintiff saying, no discounts, no discounts, and the, disc and the defendant saying, hey, we want to uh, see these discounts in the final number that might be attributed to the value of the plaintiff partner's entitlement from the partnership. The short point is the court finds in favour of the plaintiff. And uh, in working through the relevant mechanics, the court considers the position that the defendants might enjoy a bit of a windfall if, for example, on Monday um, they get to buy the plaintiff's share with 30% or, or some, some percentage sliced off for the lack of control discount and for the lack of marketability discount. Then on Tuesday they're sitting there with 100% of the plaintiff's stake but having only paid 70% for it and they might then go sell it on Wednesday or sell the entire business on Wednesday and they then enjoy a windfall of the gap that accounts for that discount. The court finds that that would be inappropriate. And so the court finds that the plaintiff will be getting an account. The court finds that the plaintiff will not be facing the minority discount. And the court invites the parties to come ahead with short minutes of order, with proposed minutes um, that the judge can then consider to say, oh yeah, it looks like these are the sort of orders I should be making. The court also makes the comment um, to say, look, it looks like this is one of those cases where the cost ought to be paid out of the corpus of the partnership should say out of the assets of the partnership. And I hope that discussion assisted you, especially in relation to these crunchy partnership questions and valuation questions. And I look forward to joining you again soon over another coffee or perhaps a tea and in respect of another case note. Cheers.